Hey everybody, happy Monday, happy MLK Day. It's a beautiful start to the week and I am so excited to see you for another episode of Let's Stay Together. And I am psyched to have my guests on today. Jennifer Morrison is such an incredible actress and we have so much to dive into, a lot of Once Upon a Time conversation and it's gonna be a lot of fun. So let me grab her right now. Hey, Jennifer. Hey. How Can you are hear you? Me okay? Yeah, you're perfect. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm good. Thank you for joining me on the show. So I, I started this show almost a year ago, back in March, when okay. COVID kind of shut the whole world down because I wanted people to have a place that they can turn to every week for some joy and hope and inspiration to hear from their favorite people. So thank you for being here. I'm so pleased to be here. Oh, amazing. And to all of your fans watching, I have their most popular questions and I'm going to ask a few at the end of the interview. But okay. man, we have a lot to get to. So if you're ready to rock, I say let's dive in. Go for it. Okay, so I'm going to humbly brag on your behalf to start and tell you that you are one of the most incredibly talented actresses, period. You have had such an impressive career um, and, and people just adore the work that you do. And it, it means a lot to a lot of the people, you know, what you're in and the characters you play and the messages you put out. So you're just a force in this industry. Um, but it is, of course, through Once Upon a Time that you skyrocketed into this worldwide fandom. So bringing it back for a minute, when that opportunity came up, what initially attracted you to wanting to do that project? Yeah, I mean, so many things. I um, The script was amazing. Um, it seemed like uh, one of those concepts that I wanted to watch, right? Like, who doesn't want to think about every fairy tale you've ever watched as a kid and uh, or fairy tale book you've read as a kid and think of them all being friends and like hanging out and m imagining what that would be like if they all interconnected. Um, and then on top of that, you know, Emma Swan, who was originally named Anna Swan in the first in the pilot script, um, was just this really amazing invention of uh, Eddie Kitsis and Adam Horowitz, who who wrote the pilot and were the showrunners. Um, and I just saw a chance to play a character who was really complicated. She was flawed and made mistakes, but would get up and try again and try to be better. And um, and it felt like a real, like full person, even though eventually she had magic and all the things that are outside the realm of real. Um, I felt like she felt like a whole person. And I was really excited about taking that on and trying to find a way to show that to the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and she was the hero, the savior of the show. So when the opportunity came up, what was that audition process like? Were you kind of always in the running for this role? Did you read other roles? How did it all happen for you? Um, it was interesting. It came to me, the script came to me through sort of random ways. Um, the woman who is now my agent, no, sorry, the woman who's now my manager, who had nothing to do with my career at the time, um, she represented uh, Joel Edgerton, and um, she and I knew each other because I had just done Warrior with Joel. And so I happened to be talking to her at like an event, and she said, you know, there's this script out there that I just feel like you would love, and I feel, I feel like would be really great for you. And um, I hadn't yet heard about it, and so then I kind of like asked my team at the time, I was like, have you guys heard of this? They're like, oh yeah, I think there's an offer out to someone, um, but we'll let you know if they pass, you know? And, um, and then that person passed and it came to me and Eddie and Adam saw me on How I Met Your Mother and they like watched a lot of my work and then they were really excited at the idea that this might be a possibility. So I met with them. I went to, um, uh, I think it was Pat's Deli on, on Ventura, I met them. That went well. Then I met um, the director, and that went well. Um, and uh, yeah, and then and then they made an offer. I mean, it was interesting because you know a lot of the attraction was knowing that Jennifer Goodwin was already involved, and I really liked the idea of working with her. And um, Robert Carlyle was already involved, and he's just someone whose work I've always admired so much. And and imagining him playing Rumpelstiltskin just seemed like Ava's wanting to join the interview here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi. So cute. Um, 
So yeah, so I, like it, it was sort of everybody coming together to see if it felt like a good fit and, and everybody felt like it was a good fit. And so um, the, the, the tricky part became um, making my schedule work. So I was still working on How I Met Your Mother. And um, in order for me to be able to be available for the pilot of Once Upon a Time, I had to ask the showrunners of How I Met Your Mother to shoot the second to last episode first. I mean, sorry, the second, the last episode first and the second to last episode last of their season in order to like, wow. like, so they really, um, we really have um, Craig and Carter from I Met Your Mother to thank for my availability um, <laughs> for once upon a time, because otherwise it would not have been possible. That's amazing. I mean, what an iconic character. She's so many things, right? She's the daughter of Snow White and Prince Charming. She's the hero. Uh, she's a total badass. What were some of your favorite things about playing Emma Swan? Yeah, I mean, everything you listed, obviously. Um, and I, I, I think I go back to this a lot, but I think it's a big deal because like I, I am a strong woman, right? But I am also an extraordinarily vulnerable person at times. And just because you're strong doesn't mean you're vulnerable. And just because you're vulnerable doesn't mean you can't be strong. Um, and I think that for me to play a character who was so heroic in a certain way, but also just as capable of being hurt and emotional, mm -hmm. to me, that was an interesting challenge. And I feel like I learned a lot about myself playing her and going through the things that she went through in that way. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that for sure. She had a lot of layers to her, which was so fun as a viewer to watch. Um, and then, of course, you got to play the dark one, which had all the fans like at the edge of their seats being like, where is she going with this character? What's gonna happen? How, how was it playing the dark one after being the hero for so long? It was really fun. I mean, I, I wished it had gone on longer. I know the fans were like, she's gotta be good. You know, like, yeah. just, like freaking out. I still will like run into people who are like, that really upset me. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Man, you got the evil walk, the way you talk, everything was down. You, you, you played evil very well. It was definitely very fun. It was very fun. And it was also fun because, you know, Eddie and Adam were really wonderful about being collaborative about that. You know, they, we were all together inventing a villain that had never existed before. And then also like inventing a villain that somehow kind of had good intentions. Um, so it was, it was a really fun process to be in that collaboration and be, be so included. Um, and it was just fun because, you know, we, we, as actors, the dream is to, to get to act every day. And I've been so lucky to be able to have that be the truth for me for so many years. Um, but the tricky part of doing a television show is then you do the same exact thing every day, you know, and part of what we're drawn to as artists is constantly evolving and changing and trying new things. So when you have writers who are willing to take a chance on you and let you do something so different five seasons in, it really is invigorating. Oh, I bet. I bet. And, and you know, you had such a good long run playing this character, six seasons, six incredible seasons. When you look back at your work, which you should be so proud of, what are some of the moments and scenes for your character that you'll never forget that that holds an extra special place in your heart as some of your favorites yeah i mean there's so many that it's almost hard the sun's going down so i'm turning my light up <laughs> <laughs> the director in me kicks in i'm like i need more light <laughs> one man shop there we go <laughs> um no there's so many uh the thing that kind of always jumps to the forefront though and maybe it's just because i love the back of the future movies so much was when they did that um, double episode where Emma and Hook kind of had their Back to the Future sort of adventure. Um, I felt like we were shooting our own little movie or something for those two episodes. And it was really the first time that Emma got to go see the world that her family and friends came from. Mm. You know, she'd only ever known the real world. She never knew that, that world. So it was like going to their home and getting to know them so differently. Um, and that was fun to discover and explore and like be in the costumes and, you know, do all those things for the first time. It was like, I felt like I had been watching this world unfold in front of me that Emma was never very much a part of. And suddenly I got to be a part of it, which was really fun. Wow. Yeah. And the costumes were, I mean, they looked heavy, but they were amazing. Yeah. Really amazing. Unless it's raining in the forest and you're dragging half the forest in your gown. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Full workout. Oh, man. And the fans also love your journey with Captain Hook, of course, and your love story throughout the whole show. And 
you know, you guys have like a million different ship names. I think the one I know is Captain Swan, I think yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. Um, how, how was it working with Colin? He was on my show. He's a gem. And, and what were some of your favorite memories with him? Yeah, so great. You know, I was very lucky because we spend all these hours on set with people. We spend more time with everyone at work than we spend with our you know, loved ones and family and friends. And um, so to have someone who is truly a friend um, was a real gift. And also like his wife was truly a friend and I got to meet his kids and be around them when they were little. And, you know, it's, it's just like, I felt like I got to gain a part of a family. You know, I, I, I was really very lucky with, with that because not everyone is that generous with their time or with their friendship. And, and I was really lucky that way. Yeah, yeah, and I think that shows too on screen. It seems like you guys just had an epic time together, which is always was, fun. You know, it's about trust. It's like anything, yeah. right? It's about trust. And we knew we had each other's backs and we knew we both wanted it to be as good as possible. And we knew that it was our jobs to, to make sure that we took the fans on this journey with us. And, um, and when you trust that in each other, you find a way to, to lift each other up when one's tired or, you know what I mean? Like you just you find that way to be there for each other. And, um, you know, I mean, I remember one time I didn't, it didn't even like cross my mind to pause where I think he gets like thrown by Rumple into uh, like a well sort of thing. Or, I don't know, some sort of buckety large, something large enough for a human to be thrown into it. And, he's got water in it. and I have to like save him from it and it's you know it's so cold outside he's just been in the water we're trying we're both shivering and shaking from the cold but trying to hide it in the scene and i'm like having to be worried if he's dying or not in the scene and all this stuff but he has to keep getting pulled out of the water each time <clears throat> and we want to do whatever it takes to get through this as fast as possible <laughs> so we don't have to keep shivering and freezing right? right and we're like so close and he comes out and just like huge gob of snot across his face and i knew you know i know from being a filmmaker as well like they're never going to use the whole take so why lose the take i'll just get the snot off his face and we'll keep going and i remember literally just like a mother like just grabbing the snot and throwing it and like continuing to cry and worry about him and they're like cut and he goes did you just take snot off my face <laughs> oh my god i was like yeah i didn't really think twice about it i just felt like i really wanted the take to happen so we could move on <laughs> oh my god okay that's that's friendship that's like a deep connection yeah but it's like we, you know the show must go on we just gotta like find a way and get through you know so that's the kind of like you know buddy you want in those yeah. scenarios and he, i know he would have done the same thing for me you know <laughs> or maybe he wouldn't have but you know I, i'd like to think he would have cleared my snot <laughs> yeah you've just stepped up like what friendship goals means for everybody watching right, right. Uh, you know, we got to step our game up. Um, that's another thing, too. I didn't even think about the you guys shot outside so much. Like you made it look easy, but I'm sure it was cold and rainy and all of it. It's you know, it's funny. It's the stuff that people don't teach uh, when you're becoming an actor. Right. Like, right. And not everyone even goes the traditional route when you're studying to be an actor, but let's say you do, you know, like let's say you take the acting classes and you have the acting coaches and you go to theater school and you start on stage, you do all the things that I, that I happen to do in my journey. Um, not once did someone say, by the way, it might be like 10 degrees outside and you're shivering, but you're going to be in a tank top and you're going to pretend that it's hot while you're also crying and giving this performance. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> it's that stuff that like you don't realize you have to learn on the fly you know what right. I mean like until you're in it and everybody you have a crew of 200 people just staring at you and you're like wow I just have to figure this out because there's nobody there to say like you know what this is the best way through this or this is how we're going to figure this out you just figure it out <laughs> well, you make it look easy, so that's a testament to the work you do, my gosh. And you you play this character for six years. She was part of your life for six plus years, probably, from audition to, to the ending. Was it strange or weird for you when you said goodbye to her? I mean, I'm the type of person that, like, I take my Christmas tree out. I'm, like, in a weird funk for a week. The seasons change. I'm seasonally emotional. Like, I am emotional all the time. I can't even imagine as an actor what it's like kind of hanging up the 
the Emma Swan jacket and moving yeah. on to the next thing? I think, you know, I'm sure this is different for everybody. Um, I tend to be someone who's like, really good in crisis and then when the crisis is cleared and I know for sure the crisis is okay that's when I break down so uh, I feel like for me it was also a little bit of a delayed reaction you know it was something that I was fighting till the the bitter end to make sure I did the best work I could possibly do and and try to give everything I could give to her and the show um and then I went straight into doing a play and while I was doing that play, I was also leaving on weekends and shooting an independent film. So I like, in a way I kind of like d dodged the, the grief. Oh, Ava. <laughs> he really gets worked up about the mailman oh. that time. Sorry. That's okay. Um, but, uh, and so I think in a way I kind of like dodged it for a second just cause I rolled into all these other things. And it wasn't really until I had a calm after all of that, mm. that I could just really let it sink in. And I think the lucky thing with Emma was that she's so in my DNA now. Like I didn't feel like I had lost her. I felt like I had gained everything she went through. And so it, it felt a little bit different. Like it felt different to me than even how I felt when I did house for six years, you know, it was like, I miss Cameron in a different way because she feels like someone very far away from me now. Mm. Whereas like with Emma, I feel like she's someone who just kind of like absorbed into me a little bit more. So I don't know if it's just where I was at as a person that made those two experiences different. Um, and I think some of it honestly is the fandom. You know, I think that the fans really keep her alive for me in a way that I really appreciate because I feel like I get to stay friends with her because I get to continue talking about her and thinking about her and, and remembering the stories, if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah, it does. It's actually really nice that you feel like she's still with you for, for all of those reasons. And, and the fandom is amazing. And we're going to talk about that in a minute because I know people wrote to me saying how much the show has meant to them, especially during quarantine yeah. um, and, and these crazy times. But when the, when the show wrapped for you, were you happy with how Emma's story kind of finished up? Yeah, I was. I really was. I felt like um, I really loved, A, that I got to do the musical episode. I grew up- That was fun. Shows, so that was like pretty epic to feel like I got to, to, to be a part of that and have that be kind of nearing the end of her journey, you know? Um, and I felt like there was something about the way they used the musical episode and the, the songs in the musical episode that really did bring this full circle completion to this person. And it felt really layered and thoughtful. And um, I thought that the composers that they brought in did such an amazing job of working with Eddie and Adam and what they had done with the show and the team of writers and what they'd done with the show, but also with Mark Isham, who was the, is the, was the composer for, for the rest of the show in terms of like, making all the little pieces like add up to one whole thing yeah. and giving it this culmination. Um, and I also felt like, you know, Emma went through a lot. She had had a really crazy journey and she didn't know her family for so much of her life. And then she finds her family, but then there's always, you know, some monster or crisis or thing, you know, I mean, it's just, it was a lot, you know, I, I would joke all the time, like, when's, when's the scene where Emma just cries in the bathtub for a while? <laughs> you know? And, um, and she'd always have to just keep going and going and going. And the fact that what they gave her was this reprieve of joy and peace at the end of all of this fighting, I thought that was really beautiful. And I thought that, um, you know, the fact that they were able to resolve her relationship with her parents and, with with Regina and with her friends in town and with Hook and and with her son and you know it just it was all it was all right I felt like it all went where it was supposed to go yeah that, that must be a good feeling to feel especially after dedicating so much time to a show which which is awesome um, and the fandom that you just mentioned a bit earlier is incredible um, I know this show means so much to so many for all different reasons and um, actually, I didn't even tell you, and I got married five years ago in April, and my sister married us, and in our custom ceremony that she created for my husband and I, she mentioned a few things we love, and when we first met, we watched Once Upon a Time. No and, way! Yeah, and That's we actually... amazing! It was, it was 
awesome. So you're mentioned in our wedding ceremony as once upon a time. So honored. Next to the margaritas and tacos we eat on our first date. Yes. So we 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 love it and we binged it again at the beginning of the, the pandemic, I guess last March as well, but I received so many messages like that. So what is it about the show do you think attracted such widespread fandom so fast? I don't know. I mean, sometimes you just don't know what it is that you've captured that, that brings that many people. I think, um, you know, Eddie and Adam are extraordinarily smart writers, talented writers. And, and I think their understanding of the sort of Joseph Campbell hero's journey idea was really powerfully implemented into the way that they decided to tell this story. Um, and I also think it was just a show that it's a show about a lot of misfits, you know, like the, everybody's different and quirky and odd and very eccentric and unique in their own way. All the different characters, there's a recognizability to some of them because we can assign sort of our memories of those fairy tales to it. But there, but what was brought to the screen, the way that these writers wrote it, I think brought a lot of misfits together. And I think, even if we think someone from our perspective is like cool or has it all together, they probably feel like a misfit. I think we all have a part of ourselves where we feel misunderstood or we feel eccentric or we feel like we don't quite know where we belong. And I think when people can watch that and a group of people like that, there's going to be someone that they can go, oh, I see a little bit of myself in that character, or I, I see something I want to be that's in that character, or something I'm going through, I can sort of project into this and walk it out through their experience. And so I think, I think we just gave people an opportunity to see themselves in these characters. Um, and I really, I really do tribute that to not just the group of actors, but really to the writers for, for finding a way to do that so effectively. Oh, yeah, there was something for everybody to connect with. And I think you're absolutely right on with that. And I also, I love the idea that, uh, gosh, especially now more than ever, the, how hopeful it was. And this idea that everybody deserves their happy ending, whatever that may be. So what did that message mean to you in, in relation to the show? Yeah, I had not fully articulated what I'm about to say yet. Like, I think that this has come to me more clearly as I've had some space and time from it, because it's also shaping the way I perceive the content that I want to create moving forward. Um, but I think that as artists, we really have a responsibility to start dreaming up a possible positive future. Um, and so many of the things that are in the world are, um, they're edgy and they're dark and that gets them a good review or that gets them like street cred. And somehow for many, many years now, we've been in this headspace that like a happy ending is cheesy. Mm. And I think that's a really, really dangerous message to tell the world. I think we should all want a happy ending. We should all want a happy beginning as we, as we turned it into on Once Upon a Time because there really are no endings. But, it's, but that is such an important Thing to internalize in our lives as human beings and when you're told that if you have a happy moment that that's cheesy that's really dangerous I think that's really a really dangerous message and so there was something about the way they were able to wind the message of hope and the idea of happy beginnings into the storytelling in a way where it was beautifully crafted the costumes were gorgeous, the sets were gorgeous, the actors worked their asses off, the writers were amazing. There was a high level of craftsmanship that was mixed with a story that said, you're not cheesy for wanting to have a good life. That's what you should want and it's what you deserve. And I think we have to have examples of stories like that or we're all in a, like real trouble. <laughs> you yeah. know, like if all we show people is apocalypse, we will create it. Um, if always, you know, it's, I mean, it, it, it's, it might sound extreme, but it's like, just think about like a James Bond movie, whatever car is in that movie, it sells out as soon as that car comes out. Think about Queen's Gambit, who was playing chess before that show? You can't even get a chess set right now. 
what we put on screen impacts the way people buy things and the way people think about things and the way people feel about themselves. And so it was a big deal for me to be a part of a show that put a possible positive future in the world. And I want to keep finding ways to do that at the highest level possible. Well, something tells me you will, and you seem committed to that. And, and I, I agree, like I went to bed every night watching the show feeling good and like not having nightmares and that it was just a good way to go to bed and wake up the next day. And I agree with you. I think we need more of that for sure. And another beautiful thing, a lot of fans wrote to me when I announced you as my guest and they said the show has really helped them with tough times they've gone through with especially bullying. Um, even I've seen cyber, which is unimaginable that right now anyone would be doing that during a pandemic, but a lot of fans have said it's happened and your show is escapism for them. So for, for everyone watching now who might be going through that tough time, what advice or hopes for you know, a better tomorrow do you want to give to them? Yeah, I mean, I, it's so tough. And I, like you just said, I can't imagine it ever, but I really can't imagine it in these times. And that really breaks my heart to hear that people are still feeling that right now. Um, I think one of the biggest things I learned working on the show is that when people try to hurt you, they're trying to make you feel what they feel. And even though that sucks and it doesn't excuse the behavior, if there's a way to take a step back and go, oh wow, that person really tried to hurt me, which means that person really hurts, mm. it, it helps have a, a sense of it not being about you. Do you know what I mean? Like that you can right. go, I can remove myself from that thing that could hurt me because it's not about me. It's about how much that person hurts and they want me to hurt as badly as they hurt. And the strongest thing you can do in that moment for yourself and for the other person is to go, what's this really about? Are you okay? Instead of going like, how dare you? And how? You know, cause then now you've got two people hurting and I know that's so hard to do. And I know that not every day that's possible. Like I'm not saying that this is like an easy thing to walk out. And sometimes I'm really good at doing this for myself. And sometimes I'm terrible at doing this for myself. You know, like it depends on where we're at and how sensitive we are in any given moment. But it really, really living those examples out in the show and having to break it down psychologically to understand why the villains are doing what they're doing or why the bad guy in that episode is doing what they're doing and realizing that it was always coming from a wound in them. And they wanted to create that wound in someone else because they didn't want to be alone in their pain. And I think if we can start to see that, we can start to take better care of ourselves. And then when we take better care of ourselves, we can have a more thoughtful reaction in some of those moments. And then maybe we can take care of each other better. Um, but I think that's the complicated answer to your question. I think the simpler answer is do the best you can to surround yourself with the good people that you can turn to when other people are being crappy and um, try really hard not to take things personally and know that everybody's going through a hard time right now and the world, whole world right now is not their best selves. Um, and to know that everyone else is just someone else to everyone else. Right. <laughs> you know, right? So I could get all hung up on if people like what I do or don't like what I do or who said this and what critics said that and who, you know, but ultimately, like, it's just another person who just has some opinions. They don't hold any power over me unless I give them the power to hurt me. <laughs> and again, it's hard to stand in that strength, but we do have the power to take care of ourselves. And, you know, I just think um, more than ever, we have to try to find our courage to take care of ourselves. Man, that is like the best advice to kick off a new year with and something that we all need to remember. Thank you for sharing that. I, I love everything that you just said. I know all your fans are going to take that to heart too. Um, speaking of the fans, I'm going to ask you a few of their questions Great. now before I let you go. So these were the most popular ones I received, both Once Upon a Time themed, but also other fun things related. Um, so first one, how does it feel to know that a character you played influenced 
tons of girls across the entire world? And do you realize that? That was a big question. <laughs> I, I don't think I totally comprehended. I, I, I get glimpses of it, glimpses of it, obviously, when I like, now it's virtual conventions, but like when I would go to conventions and things like that, or I see little girls dressed as Emma Swan or, or adults dressed as Emma Swan, as anyone dressed as Emma Swan. Um, and, but I don't think I fully get it. Like I can, I, I sort of said this before, like the first time I kind of started to comprehend it was when I saw Wonder Woman for the first time, because I had a really emotional reaction to imagining if the little girl version of myself was allowed to, to see that movie. Like if I had seen that movie when I was 10 years old, what right. that would have done for me to have a hero like that and to have uh, a female heroine to look up to who knew how to take care of herself and who was brave and strong, but also vulnerable and smart and all these things. And I was like, wow, I really didn't, I didn't watch anything like that when I was 10 years old, you know? And, and it, that was the first time that I had a sense that there was a version of that going on with Emma Swan, you know, that there was a variation on a theme there um, in terms of young women seeing a woman who knows how to stand up for herself and take care of herself and have all the things that I just listed. And so kind of through my own feelings of another project, um, I was able to kind of get a sense of like how lucky I was to be a part of that. Um, but I don't think I'll ever fully grasp what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it must be pretty surreal. I, I could totally see that. It's, but it's amazing. It's, it's a testament, again, to the work you did and what you put out there. Um, another popular question, directing. So you were recently in New York doing a project. Can you share anything more about that and yep. uh, your love for directing in general? Yeah, so I was just in New York and I was directing um, two episodes of Dr. Death, which is a new series for Peacock. And um, it's the same company that um, I directed a pilot for called One of Us is Lying. So that's all gearing up to start shooting. So there's going to be a lot more of my directing work starting to come out. It, it, everything's a little bit backlogged right now because of the quarantine and the pandemic and everything getting put on hold. So, um, but uh, I had a great experience. The, the cast is amazing. Josh Jackson plays um, Dr. Dunch and Alec Baldwin and Christian Slater and Kelsey Grammer are in a part of it. And, Grace Gummer and Molly Griggs, and um, I mean, it goes on and on, but I, it, it was just an incredible cast to get to work with, um, and just an incredible team. Patrick McManus is the showrunner, and he's just an incredible writer who I really love working with. I um, was super grateful that he trusted me with this. Um, a medicine and cinematographer that I work with on this that I will continue to work with, Zach Galler, who's incredibly talented as well. So it was just a really, it was a trying, time in terms of protocols and trying to figure out how to keep everybody safe and testing every day and double masks and shields and a lot of hand washing and people handing out hand sanitizer constantly and trying to stay six feet away and, you know there are all sorts of new things to adapt to to be able to make something right now um but i'm really proud of the work i'm really proud to be a part of the team and i think it's going to be a great show so i'm, I'm excited to see how that comes together Amazing. Well, we can't wait to see that. I'm sure you'll post about it when, when it's gearing up to come out. So we look yeah. forward to that very much so. Um, okay, what else? The third most popular question. Now, I know you get this all the time, but if I don't ask you this, the fans are going to come for me. <laughs> so is there any way, shape, or form down the line in some capacity that you would reprise your role as Emma Swan in something? I mean, I don't know. Who, wh what do we want to do? Should we make a musical? Should we make a movie? All of it. All of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, of course. I, who knows? It's, it's so funny because, you know, when you're on the inside of all this stuff, it is a miracle that anything gets made. It's truly, truly a miracle that anything ever gets made. I... I, I marvel at what it takes to get everybody on a set. I never believe it's real until we're on the set. And then even once we're on the set, I don't really believe it's real until it's over. Um, so there are a lot of things that go into that logistically, obviously, uh, especially with it being um, such a sort of huge franchise that owns it. You know, it's a Disney situation. And um, they would have to decide that they wanted to do whatever it is they wanted to do. And, and I'm sure all of us would be right there 
ready to be a part of it. But um, uh, I don't know that I would want to do a long running series of it again. I think that like that would be probably hard on my life at this point. But if it were like, you know, a movie or a mini series or a musical or I don't know, no, there's got there's got to be all sorts of different iterations that could be possible. Listen, you maybe just gave people the best gift of 2021, <laughs> just the possibility of it happening. <laughs> But like, I don't want to give false hope. There's not anything in the works. It's not like there's the like works. something in the pipeline. <laughs> but you never know what can come. And that's, that's the, there's the hope. So we, we like hope. I love that. Um, and the last big fan question was actually about your cooking. People love all your cooking videos and your pizzas. I'm Italian boy. I love that you make your pizzas. What, um, what else are you cooking up these days? Yeah, I know. I need to branch out. I feel like I got really kind of fixated on the pizza cheesecake situation. But you know, it's that thing of like, if that's what people like, you keep making it. And so, yeah. um, you know, there was <laughs> my, my closest people were definitely a fan of the pizza and the cheesecake. So I think um, I, I've been out of practice with the, the cheesecake and the pizza till Christmas, which was like high pressure because I was making it in El Salvador for Jerry's family for the first time. And oh it was like gosh. to be in a different kitchen and kind of not know where everything is and like be in a different country where like everything we bought at the grocery store was a little different than, <laughs> right. you know. So uh, I felt a little bit stressed and worried that it wasn't gonna turn out, but we did, I did pretty well. I did pretty well considering I'd been like out of the pizza game for like three months. Um, and I will, I, we're going to do a second Christmas here next weekend. So I will do another uh, pizza and cheesecake for that. But I think, I really think I need to focus on making an alpha whore. I mean, and now anyone who follows my El Salvadorian adventures knows that this is like my favorite dessert that is like this El Salvadorian thing where I guess they make it in some other Latin countries as well, but they're usually just like little cookies. So they're like, it's almost like a shortbread and a shortbread with like a caramel filling in, in between. Um, and they're usually like little cookies, but they do like full cake size ones in El Salvador. And with wow. coffee at like lunchtime, it is so perfect and divine. And so I, I think I need to like work on figuring out an alcohol bar next. Okay, that sounds pretty epic. So please figure that out and share with all of us. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, for all your fans watching who have stood by your side and cheered you on and are following you, you know, for your entire rest of your career. What do you want to say to them who are tuned in right now? Honestly, I just want to say thank you. I love you guys so much. I really do. I'm not just saying that. I feel like one of the most beautiful silver linings that we can take from this crazy time that we're in right now is that we're all realizing how similar we are and how much we do have in common. And I really feel that with all of them. I feel that through their love and their support and the way they support the charities that I support and the way that they really pay attention and, and want to do good. And um, it really, really, really means a lot to me. And um, I'm just super grateful to feel like I've been able to have the gift of connecting with all of these people I would never have had the chance to know otherwise. And um, so yeah, outside of just saying thank you, I just want to say like, stay safe, stay healthy stay grounded, find the things that you love and take care of yourselves and each other. Beautiful sentiment to end with. Jennifer, I had so much fun with you. I feel like I've known you forever. Me I love, love getting a chat with you. Hopefully next interview will be in person. Yeah. When I'm in LA, I'm based in New York, but hopefully I can get back to LA soon and we can do some fun things together in the future. A hundred percent, I would love that. Thank you for all that you do. I think it's so awesome that you're doing this series and that you've been keeping people's spirits up and giving them so much to look forward to. I think it's awesome. So I'm, I'm really honored to be a guest. Oh, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Be well, sending you so much love from New York and until we meet again. You too, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.